We're taking you beyond the red line. I am Dr. Carrasco. I specialize in treating those who suffer from pain. This is the Dr. Carrasco Show. Is he screaming, yelling? What's he no, doing? He's very calm. He's not mad at all. He doesn't respond at all. His voice is very calm all the time. Um, so does he want me to call him, or what did he say? You think I need to call him? All right. Well, I'll call him. See what he says. Thank you. Are you leaving yet, or no? No, I'm here. All right, if I need, I'll ask you something if I need you. Okay. Mr. Warner, Dr. Carrasco, how are you today? This is a perfect example of a gentleman who, you know, just wants to get better. He has to get better. He's got a family. He's, he's got to do something, you know, and, and it's just interesting about this case is it happens a lot of cases. The average guy, not everybody, but the average guy would have taken the whole day off. He went in there, you know, just got a job, wants to keep his job, went to work. Did his two hours of work and came in and got the procedure done. That's pretty, pretty amazing if you ask me. So let's see how he does and go from there. Let me just say my final goodbyes. Okay, todo fue muy bien. Okay, no se apure. Si hay problemas, me avisa, okay? Everything went great, my friend. Okay. Any questions at all? Let me just take a look here. Okay. No, you're a caring doctor, it's evident. It's cool. Really easy to tell. Thank you. You know, hopefully this is just all you need for a long time. But I know he's a hard worker. He worked today before he came to work, so he's got to do the therapy. We'll work with you. If you got to see you in the afternoon, a little bit later than normal patients, we will, or in the morning. But the therapy is going to be very, very important for your shoulders. I mean, you, you can hardly bring your arm out this way. You can hardly bring your arm out this way. So. Or to sleep or anything, it was keeping him from sleeping all well because he tossed and turned. Tossed and turned all night? Well, you know, a lot of patients who are injured like yourself, you know, have to make adaptations. Mm -hmm. Things that we, don't, we just kind of take for granted. Yeah, you make some changes. If you make some changes, then we'll work with it. Yeah, and I would like to be able to um, use the workout room a little bit more. You know, I take it real easy, like I walk on the treadmill. Okay. Well, that's our goal. I mean, our goal is we'd love to get you back to 100% like you were before, but if we can get you back slowly, you know, just like any other in injured athlete, get them back slowly and they'll stay there. If not, we go too fast, I've got to warn you because I think you're one of those kind of get it done kind of guys, you'll end up hurting yourself, you know, more than you need to. So take your time. Let's take several months to get you where you need to be. Okay. 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 And we're going to talk about some other things that we talked to him yesterday about getting someone to see him, someone to get him some more rehabilitation if we need to. You know, he's having some other difficulties that happen after a horrible injury. Let me just tell you, we're here to work with you. You know, we need your part too, but we'll do our part. Okay? Okay. Okay. Thank you, sir. Take care. Okay, take care now. Uh, Mr. Werner and his family, his wife and his child, moved to San Antonio to be closer to her family. He sometimes stutters a little bit as he's trying to get some things out, but he seems like it's very, very normal. I saw him for the first time on May the 6th, 2009. You came to me from Utah? Yes, sir. I've been here for three weeks now. Did you like Utah? Is it, is it kind of open or what do you like about it? Yeah, that was probably the one thing I liked the most about Utah was all the open land. Really neat. I mean, you wanted to go mountain biking, you had a huge choice of where you could go. If you wanted to just go hiking, you huge choice. Um, I used to have a backpack 
And sure. then you can have a trailblazer backpack and you throw her in the back of it and she was only one and a half and one I was doing ever since she was six months and we go hiking out two, three miles with the wife and me and the reason we moved here from Utah was due to my uh, wife's family lives down here. And that always happens, doesn't it? <laughs> yeah, and wife. When I was in my training, I was in Cleveland, like, don't get married in Cleveland, you gotta be back every winter and freeze to death up there. So, <laughs> exactly. So she moved down here because of what? Family. Um, just the fact that she witnessed the whole accident and you know, being told her was gonna die. The accident was when, remind me again? June the 1st of 07. Kind of put that picture for me. I don't really, I don't remember it though. This is all just from witnesses, from the police statements. I was actually headed towards a uh, light, okay. and the light was turning yellow. She was um, coming from behind, okay. so if she was actually coming right from behind me. I was just getting over into the left-hand lane, mm -hmm. and I was stopping at the yellow light. And so as I was stopping at the yellow light, the girl assumed I was going through the yellow light, and she had accelerated to chase the yellow light. She was on her cell phone. Actually, her police statement says, I was on my cell phone when he got into my way. Oh, and when she accelerated, she sped up to 45 miles an hour. She hit my rear tire at 45 miles an hour. Um, I was gripping the throttle and the brake, and so that while I was gripping it and I was hit, I came backwards, and by me going backwards, that's where I caused injury in my shoulder. If that shoulder hits, the shoulder is mobile. So the structure support are going to what? The first thing they're going to do is going to give. They're going to give in. So these muscles back here are going to pull. They're going to be stretched out and maybe even that's how it gets to tear. So the shoulder is going to be pushed through here, pushed forward, trying to give as much as it can to absorb the impact. Then at a certain point when it can't absorb anymore, it's got a choice. It'll tear, it'll break. Mm -hmm. Slid across her hood, head first through her window, and went up into the frame the left hand frame of where the windshield bounds to the frame. And yeah, kind of the top part. Of yes, sir. Uh -huh. And I, that's where I hit my, the piece of metal stabbed me in my skull and uh, then the side window got me right here and then it went all the way there. Well, imagine when you hit that windshield, you're next going to try to bend forward because it's not going to be hard rock. At the neck, it's got flexion, so it'll tend to flex forward, but still go through the windshield, as an example. Well, that's going to pull all these nerves. It's going to stretch them out as much as possible. What's critically important about this is that when you see patients who have an injury like his, the mechanism of injury or how they got hurt is very, very important. Now you will know what muscles are probably involved. I went into her car, and then when she finally came to a stop, I ejected from the car. And I went approximately Thirty-five yards forward, forward, right. So it threw me, um, and then that's my wife was actually driving right next to me in her car when this happened. So she witnessed the whole entire oh accident. She um, and, and lucky enough, the paramedics were coming, and my wife got out of the car. And she actually held my neck and head together, tried to hold it together. And all the bleeding. All the sure. bleeding. She said it was so intense. She had to actually go to therapy for a while. And they did not have a neurosurgeon there, so they helicopter flighted me to uh, UMC. I was uh, in, put into a, an induced coma. In an accident like that, he was taken to the emergency room, obviously. And when they first took him there, according to the reports, he was combative, so they went ahead and intubated him and uh, sedated him some. There they did CT scans of the head, CT scans of the brain, CT scans of the shoulder, of the chest, of the back, of the pelvis. It's interesting, they found, you know, kind of significant things, were, which was he had some trauma and some bruising to the top of the humerus, the top of the shoulder. They also found he would call it supraspinous tendon tear, which is one of the tendons that kind of supports the shoulder girdle had been torn to some extent. I mean, nothing 
severe and out of the ordinary, but he has a tear there. My wife was told that I wouldn't make it. Um, so she, for almost a day or two, she was told I wasn't going to make it. So for her to go say her goodbyes to me, and then she was told I would make it, but I'd probably not walk properly or even have parts of my body or motor skill problems. And then probably about a week into it, they said I was probably going to be okay and I'd be able to use all my extremities. And then I would probably have speech problems. So she lost me almost in her mind, and the fact that she would have been on her own with my daughter. No, you, you're telling me I'm trying to help you get better. For yourself and for your wife and for your daughter, you owe it to them, you owe it to yourself to try to get better. I, whatever it takes to make you better, that's okay with me. So you're in the hospital, you're in a coma for two weeks? Yes, all right. Yes, sir. Okay. From there, um, just I woke up about a over two weeks later, and um, then I wanted my wife. I wanted out of the hospital so I could be near my daughter was why. But I was combative at the time. I mentally, I wasn't in my right mind to be making decisions like that. So I was released from the hospital a day later. They wheelchaired me out to the parking lot with my wife. I got into my car and it was real tough. It was The move was tough. The move was by myself. We got a U-Haul. We moved down here um, pretty much. I had to unload this U-Haul and I was in a lot of pain and it was so intense. It was, I felt like throwing up. I felt, you know, but I gotta get the job done. Um, it's pretty hard right now um, with my shoulder. Your, your pain is kind of right here, right? Oh, in the back? Here. There and then also here, is that right? And then also right there? Uh, yes, sir, it's my right shoulder. That's because I was on the throttle, so when I was ripped off, that's why I suffered tears in my shoulder. Sometimes the pain of my shoulder just deletes the pain in my back because the pain in my shoulder is more intense than anywhere else. And, but when my shoulder's doing good, then, some, then my back starts to hurt. <laughs> okay. My shoulder, I can't, like, just doing that is painful. Unfortunately, I would like to not raise my shoulder, uh, but I have to work and family, I have a daughter and a wife. Sure. So I have two jobs now. I have two jobs now. I, and it's probably the hardest I've been working since my accident. There's a theory about myofascial pain or muscle pain. Sometimes in my experience, muscle pain is harder to treat than even a true herniated disc or a broken bone. There are fibers that essentially let the muscle contract or relax. If you look at muscles, they have fibrils. Think of it as a little thread of a rope. They become together, become fibers, and then fibers together become a muscle. Well, imagine a small tear there, and these small, tiny thousands of these little things on each muscle. When they're torn through a, a tear of the muscle, then if those micro hemorrhages occur there, sometimes that causes severe damage that at the microscopic level, which is not very well understood, they will continue to have pain for a long, long time. Here's the infraspinatus muscle that is here, attaches to the actual shoulder girdle itself. It's going to cause you to have pain here, here. Yep, so all the right, way down right the arm. Right into the arm. Yes, okay. sir. Think about a charley horse. You know, have you ever had a charley horse? Yeah. See, like when you bend your leg, it goes away when you straighten up. See, like the whole leg is hurting? Yes. It's the same thing with this. These muscles are referring pain to different parts of the body. See, here's the levator scapula muscle that attaches to the shoulder blade. So that's what it feels like something's pulling on mm -hmm. the back of my head. And so you're going to feel pain there, kind of there into there. Now, there's a bunch of muscles. We got the rhomboid muscles that we're talking about that are a concern for us. And the other muscles, I could show you these books forever, but you know, the shoulder girdle, the trapezius, the subscapularis muscle, those are all muscles we have to try to treat. So let's talk the accident. So you had a la big laceration here, probably had a lot of staples, right, all the way down to there? It was 62 staples. Uh -huh. So it's 62 staples that went from the top of my head all the way down my neck. All the way down my chest. This was real painful. It's still, I get a lot of pain in the scarring 
Mm -hmm. The actual scarring, a lot of pain. I'm, I'm constantly picking at it, pulling at it. I know this sounds like sick in a way, but it gets so irritating. I almost want to feel like cutting myself, like cutting off the scar tissue because it's how, that's how irritating it gets. Sure. Now, these things here, these are called neuromas. Okay, so let me talk to you about what that means in a kind of generic way. This is a nerve. You know, all our body has little nerves and that's how we feel every little thing that happens. But sometimes what happens is that this is a nerve that kind of goes from here all the way to there, I suppose. And when you have an accident and you have a, and have a laceration or a cut, what happens sometimes that nerve goes in here and, and it can't really make it all the way there and it just kind of gets stuck in a little ball called a neuroma. Our body has five senses as we know. And one of them is sensation. And how does that happen? These little small little nerves have to be everywhere, all in every part of your body. And that's how we can feel here and here and here and here. Well imagine that you went and you made an incision, okay? then those nerves that are crossing over supplied area, they try to grow back just like that and give you normal sensation. Sometimes because of scarring or for whatever reason, the nerve can't cross that bridge and grows into what we'll call it a tumor or a neuroma, a little band of, of nerve tissue, and that area become very tender. And if you like a little sharp poking pain, a little stabbing, a little pains, so what we do is go in here and just inject a little, a little bit of local anesthetic or numbing medicine, a little bit of steroid right underneath that scar everywhere that it hurts there. And maybe not all of them will go away, but a lot of them will improve significantly. It's just that that tissue and that nerve kind of all got pushed together as it scars. You know, it's not like everywhere else in the body that the tissue and that nerve gets stuck together. You just kind of have to inject some medication. It'll probably improve significantly from that standpoint. And even in this spot too. So we'll do that spot and we'll do these and a lot of that will improve. Now the other thing you have is myofascial pain or muscle spasms. Muscle spasms are the, one of the biggest reasons that people have pain. So the plan is to do neuroma scar injection, inject the scar itself. Uh, we'll do trigger points, trigger point injections into the muscles that are both the shoulder blade and between the shoulder blades. See if that doesn't settle that scenario. I think as we treat all this, it'll all start getting better. Okay. All right. Anything else? Tomorrow morning? Tomorrow morning. We'll give you all the details and we'll get it done for you. Okay. Okay. Thank you for your time. Yes, sir. Pleasure meeting you. All right. Good. She's going to get you ready and I'll see you in the morning. So our goal was to look under x-ray, make sure there's no metal or foreign objects, make sure there's no holes in the scalp, because sometimes they do a burr hole if you have bleeding, make sure that we can not penetrate the scalp for sure. Make sure there's no shiny material like glass. Glass will look kind of shiny and refract a little bit of the light. But then if not, then we'll just go in and defend, identify the area of tenderness, and generally he can tell you where it hurts. And then we examine all the way up and down the scar. So where does it hurt? Is it tender? You mark the area. Then what we need to do is put a local anesthetic or numbing medicine, a little bit of steroid, and go all the way down the scar to the areas that we need. And that will help him stop a lot of that pain. The steroid is responsible for getting rid of the inflammation, maybe stopping the inflammation around the little neuroma or the little bundle of nerves and stop his pain. Procedures, it's, it's not really dangerous. The only danger with him is that since we inject it right across here, the jugular vein, the carotid artery, all these major nerves come right through there. So we have to make sure that we don't inject into the actual artery or the vein, because you end up with a seizure or, or even something worse than that. So we have to go in there and essentially infiltrate and try to lift the scar off the, the tissue below it. We think that there's some compression going on between the scar and the tissue, that if we can lift it off of there, the inflammation goes away and the irritation that he has will now also improve, and it worked pretty well. The next thing we did was go in and try to inject into the shoulder itself. Because he has what we call trigger points, or areas of muscle tenderness, 
those will actually trigger pain when you, when you push on them. It's like having small little Charlie horses all over these muscles. The same thing there is to try to go in and inject a local anesthetic and steroid into that area to try to stop the inflammation, stop the pain, and allow them to have more movement. All right, what are you feeling with those? Just a, um, a little tension, that's about it. But equally important, and during this whole time, our goal is to do therapy, to do rehab for him. Because without the rehab, both to the scars, to minimize the desensitization or the sensitivity of the scar, and also to the muscles. Without that, he will improve somewhat, but it never will improve totally. But it never will improve totally. But it never will improve totally. Head first through her window. When you have someone who has a traumatic brain injury, you've had trauma to your brain. Let's go over what, first of all, caused the traumatic brain injury. Hit my, the piece of metal stabbed me in my skull. That's what we call a contusion. Okay. That contusion may then cause swelling. And then there's secondary injury, which is, can be as important, if not more damaging. Now, whether there's any long-term problems, only time will tell. In the case of Mr. Werner, when we, we talk about therapy, it becomes not just a physical, but a mental. Literally, their personality can change. They may be perfectly well once again in reacting to everything, but they get mad real easy. Right, but I understand that you, you're that you're upset about this. Well, I know that you're hurting, sir. And I saw you last time, and you said that your scarring was improved and it was less sensitive and your pain was better. You also have to take this real serious. I mean, you got to remember what I told you. We spent a long time in the office talking about how we needed to get you better and how your program was going to require rehab. We talked about it's going to require some injection therapy, and you agreed to have it done.